Okay, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Sweet. Uh, thanks for giving up your evening to come here to work today to hear me pontificate on stuff that I care about a lot. Uh, seriously, I appreciate it. Um, so I joined Intercom earlier this year after spending a decade in Google, uh, mostly with these, well, pretty much all that time on the site reliability team. Um, in my spare time in Google, I also worked on a group on a team called Team Development, where we flew around the world doing team building and uh, so it was, uh, personal development training to teams that really needed help. Uh, usually, they wanted to work a bit, know how to work a bit better. Um, one of the big things I learned about was something called psychological safety, and that's what I hope to talk about tonight, and how it uh, impacts your teams. So, first off, we're going to talk about, uh, yeah, where did this come from? The training courses that we used to build uh, were based on research that was later, later published as Project Aristotle, uh, where they tried to work out what were the determinants of a successful team. And it turns out it's nothing to do with how much you pay people, how long they've been around the company, how senior they are. Uh, the number one thing that determines a successful team uh, is turns out to be psychological safety. Um, so let's try and work out what that actually means. There's a bunch of other stuff. I feel free to look up Project Aristotle. There's a bunch of interesting stuff, but we're going to concentrate on number one. So here's five questions that you could answer, instead of, that you could ask your, you and your teammates. Um, if you answer yes to most of these, or hesitate, there's a chance that your work environment is psychologically unsafe. So, psychologically, sorry, psych, being psychologically unsafe is not a big deal. Uh, these teams, sorry, not a big deal. It's not the end of the world. Such teams can perform for short periods of time. Um, as long as you put like personal stuff in the cupboard, you concentrate on the work, you concentrate on your goals and shipping, but eventually these teams will underperform sometimes drastically and eventually break up because unsafe teams can't handle change, can't handle conflict. So I'm going to reinforce this maybe by getting you to think of an engineer you've worked with over the last few years. Imagine bright new graduate, we're going to call her Karen today. Um, she's just finished college, joined your company, she's a badass. Uh, she's put in with a, a strong operations team. Um, the team's you know, pretty good, they've been around a few years, the company's solid, the product's solid, everything's looking great. Right? So I'm sure you, th you can think of someone who this reminds you of. But one day this Karen, she made a mistake. Uh, she got all excited about an optimization she'd seen somewhere on the internet, maybe Stack Exchange or something, and she went, ah, oh, sweet. Uh, applied that to production and everything went horribly wrong. Total outage, everything's on fire, but it's cool, right? Her team, seasoned engineers, they step in, they say it's cool, roll it back, mitigate, uh, everything's everything's fine, everything's fine, great. Okay. Later on that week then, they um, have a post-mortem meeting and the director comes in and waits in and says, I think it's completely unacceptable that anyone could risk an outage while chasing a small optimization like this. That was absolutely irresponsible, Karen, don't do it again. Karen promised she would never optimize anything without permission and uh, moved on. The director probably never thought anything more of it, but you can be damn sure Karen did. But safety isn't eroded by one incident. Uh, no one on the team pointed out that mistakes happen, you know? Shit happens, we all had outages. No one pointed out that there was no tests. While well, they loads of tests for code, there was no unit tests and, and integration tests for the configuration system. Um, the whole team was really proud of their uptime. It was, you know, they used to put it on a big console right by their desk. So when this new hire came in and screwed it up, they were really angry with um, it. Karen realized that the team just didn't have her back. Um, their uptime was more important than her. Uncool. So this team as well, it was new ground for Karen, right? She's a new graduate. She'd never done operation stuff before. Um, she wasn't feeling terribly competent after this incident. Uh, now she's also terrified of making mistakes. She feels like she can't ask for help because the team are also senior. And anytime she asks, they're like, oh, I can't believe you don't know that. Um, also, the team, they were a high performing team, a load of badasses, right? They had loads of work in front of them. The pace was very, very high. So that kind of workload meant that there wasn't a lot of spare time for professional development, for training courses. Um, and the team seemed okay with that, right? They didn't need it. They seemed to be happy to read books and go to conferences like everyone else. Uh, you can be damn sure that after a few months of this, Karen developed imposter syndrome, right? She turned down interesting work because it might be too scary. There might be a risk of failure, and she wasn't into that. So 
Her background was algorithms, data structures, distributed computing. She didn't do any operations classes. She didn't do any on-call or incident management stuff in college. Uh, but it didn't matter, right? She had her own speciality. And after a few months, she realized the system as a whole was suboptimal. Um, she realized that it could never handle load spikes. The, the way it was designed, it would never ha handle them. And the team seemed OK with that because they would blame the customers on the load spikes. They had specific contracted rates. If it went over, you know, the system might fall over, but you could turn around and blame the customer and tell them not to do it again. Um, Karen thought this was a bit strange, proposed a new design uh, based on some open source software that she used during an internship previously. But our coworkers, they were kind of unfamiliar with this software. Uh, they were happy with the way everything worked, and they decided, you know, they just had a bunch of outages, they're not willing to risk more downtime with some experimental software. So Karen dropped the proposal without an argument. She came to write code. She didn't come to, uh, to argue with engineers who didn't want to change. But then, of course, uh, there was a big outage again. And then a second one. And the CEO stormed into the operations area and demanded a meeting. Everyone went in and said, like, what the hell's going on with two giant outages this week? The director explained what had happened, why it had happened, customers going over rates. And Karen pipes up and goes, I've got an idea for a design that'll mean this will never happen again. And the director rounds on her and just says, we already discussed this at a design review. We're not doing it. It's too risky. The company can't handle any more risk. She came out of the meeting kind of, I suppose, down. And she turned around to one of the teammates and was like, why, why is the director so gung-ho about this design that he has that he knows isn't working? And the teammate shrugged his shoulders and thought, well, you know, they've been delivering for five or six years. Uh, there's no point in, in, in uh, I don't really want to you know, argue with them. Um, they know best. So Karen had to think about this. She decided to leave work early go home, set up some interviews, and within about three weeks, she was gone. The company didn't miss her, of course. You know, she was whiny, she broke stuff, uh, she kept suggesting things that were too dangerous and scary, she wasn't a good culture fit. Uh, yeah, the company didn't miss her, even though she had the design that would have stopped the outages and the eventual customer exodus that results from it. So, show of hands, anyone know anyone that that kind of reminds them of? Yeah, we possibly have all been there, uh, but we've definitely always worked at something like that. So I'm going to come up with or mention a few things I think that can help across all of these roles uh, to, to somewhat mitigate this. The number one thing is is respect. It's impossible to give 100% of work if you're always pretending to be somebody else. Uh, being careful or careless and thoughtless uh, with your words can often uh, shut people down, shut people out, and make them go quiet. Some examples where I've personally intervened was where um, we had a new project manager joined our team, uh, happened to be female, and one of the junior engineers on the team was like, oh, cool, uh, and started explaining the product to her in baby talk, thinking that she wasn't technical at all, uh, to step in and go, well, actually, you know, our new team members got a PhD in computer science, I'm sure they'll be fine. Uh, and at the time, there was a bunch of us just chatting at work. Um, discussing where we'd been, and someone had recently been, I think they'd taken redundancy out of AOL, back when AOL was going through a rough patch. And the reaction was kind of horrific, right? The, one of the engineers said, oh, AOL, and you'd admit that in public? So straight away you have to turn around and go, that's not cool, that's a perfectly acceptable thing. Can you just think about like how nasty that sounded? Um, yeah, immediate, you have to do it immediately. Or we've all seen those bright, chat quiet engineers in meetings who just don't talk. Uh, it's good halfway through the meeting to say, do you know, can you shut up, and you shut up, and you shut up, because these two here haven't said anything, and that means we've probably missed something important. Call them out, give them an opportunity directly. Um, it's essential to challenge any kind of lack of respect immediately, politely, and in front of everybody. The Amer Australia's old chief of the army, I think he's retired now, had a great line that the the um, standard you walk past is a standard you accept. And if you don't challenge that kind of respect immediately, everyone else present think that's just how you do things in the company, and they'll carry on just like you, especially if you're in a senior role or a management role. Um, it would have been nice, for instance, if one of the senior engineers on the team had reminded Karen's manager, in this case, that the test coverage wasn't great, and it was a time bomb waiting to happen. It just happened to be her. 
So, uh, I don't know. Business people are always talking about innovation without any real idea of what they mean. Uh, to me, it's building space and time for people to take chances. Uh, some companies talk about 20% time and intercom we have this concept of buffer weeks where we do a six week cycle where you publish your goals to the rest of the company, you make commitments around this, uh, but that once that six week cycle is done, you get a buffer week where you can do whatever you want. And some great stuff comes out of that when you realize you can do anything, it doesn't matter if you fail, you're not impacting the commitments you made to the rest of the company. Um, but be careful with this kind of innovation time. Uh, I worked with BMW previously. Uh, they had innovation time, I think, in their Berlin motorbike factory that was between 2.30 and 3 on Tuesdays. <laughs> I was trying to explain to them that it seemed like uh, an innovation culture, and they said, oh, people often come and share their ideas. I'm sure. But um, in this case, you can imagine Karen would have really appreciated someone saying, yeah, that, that project isn't going to work, we don't like that design because of X, I'm going to help you with it and we'll get it over the line. Uh, another thing is just celebrate when things go well. Uh, it can be simple things like we have a whiteboard and work where we write down all the stuff on post-its and as we, as we have small little successes you move the post-its from the to-do to the done pile and it goes, hey. But you can also celebrate failure. Uh, many moons ago I was a storage accessory and we were moving from one storage stack to another. It was pretty crazy. We're moving exabytes and exabytes of data. And uh, it, one day it went horribly wrong. There was a bad battery, lightning, uh, sorry, bad batteries, thousands of them, bad firmware, shitty software, bad tools. We were moving very fast with an aggressive schedule. We lost a data center worth of storage. It was pretty terrific. It took about three days to get everything up and running again. Uh, the team was dejected, demoralized, defeated. It was, it was horrific. But uh, a friend of mine smacked me on the back and said, John, you just learned more about your storage stack in the last three days than you had in the, in the last three months. Uh, hey, I was right. He said, go celebrate that. I have no idea how you celebrate that. So I went down to Spar, got three bottles of the cheapest sparkling wine they had, booked out a conference room, got the two teams that were involved and said, right, write down everything on the whiteboard you can think that you learned. And we toasted every time we learned something. Um, after about an hour and a half, two hours, the team that left was very, very different. Uh, the project kept going for the 18 months. It was eventually a success, the largest data migration in history. It was pretty cool. Uh, we didn't actually lose anything in the end. So, success. In this case, I'm sure Karen would have loved someone celebrating her discovering that they had no unit tests on their config files. Last, uh, last kind of generic one is human communication, right? It's demented. We're using sound waves, using lumps of, generated by lumps of meat to try and communicate the what is there between brains, uh, you know, the, the connections in our brains. So be conscious when you communicate. One simple thing is always, when you have an expectation, you want someone to do something, uh, ask them to make a commitment. So you say something along the lines of, can you build a monitoring for that new, that new, uh, the new router platform? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, can you commit to doing that in three weeks? And they go, oh, no, no, I thought you just said, were we actually, could I do it? Of course I could do it, but it would take months, right? So it's really important to get that kind of commitment uh, from people. Rather than telling an engineering team, your reliability is our number one thing. Tell them just how reliable it is. Like, we want five nines of nine reliability is much more useful than it's our number one thing. Because it's not your number one thing. The number one thing is you don't want to get arrested for doing something legal in work. I'm not sure what the, you could do that would increase uptime, but I'm sure there's something. Uh, jailing interns in the office or something. But like, you say, this is what we're looking to do, these are the goals, and then you just go with whatever you want outside those. Don't be too specific. I've seen engineers panicking because they're trying to work out, I don't know, we can, we can make a latency win here, but it'll cost us $25,000. I don't know, I don't know. Well, let's have a chat with the product manager. Do your customers care about latency? Yes, it's very important to them. How important? Is it a million dollars important? Oh yeah. Okay, fuck it, 25. $1,000, that's, that's nothing then. Latency is king. Have those open conversations with your development partners or whoever else really cares, and it will make your team far happier in the long term. Um, okay, so, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this in three minutes, but okay. Uh, what's specifically unsafe about operations? I'm gonna whirlwind through this. I'm gonna call the number one thing is interrupts. Humans suck at multitasking. Uh, generally, if you try and do two to three things at once, you'll be half speed on all of them. Uh, just, just don't. Uh, try and bound your team somehow so you have one person on interrupts and the other people on development or two people on interrupts and the rest on development. One of the wonderful talks on this is by Dave O'Connor. 
uh, another red bricky for those who care about these things. Uh, he has a video from using uh, SRECon two years ago called Bot Machinery, and it's a, a wonderful thing on how you deal with interrupts. Another interesting piece of psychological research here came on uh, how humans deal with risk. Basically, the more uncertain you are and the more risk there is, and let's face it, in operations, we take on the risk for the whole organization. Uh, when humans are exposed to this kind of risk, our appetite for information grows way past the point where it's sensible. Uh, you often see this where people subscribe to developer mailing lists and read hundreds of emails a day on all the possible changes in the system just so they might catch that one thing that might you know, catch them at something. Or these people who build ridiculously ornate uh, dashboards with hundreds and hundreds of images where they cannot possibly do any kind of correlation, but it makes them feel better about maybe something horrible will happen. Uh, okay. Another interesting one is on call. So it turns out research by the NHS has shown that 24-7 on call isn't actually the problem. Uh, being, doing work while on call isn't actually the problem. The problem is purely the length of the on call shift and the expectation of doing work. So if you have on call where you really honestly don't expect to be paged, that's fine. But if you think you're going to be paged, yeah, that's a serious stress thing. And the more this goes on, there's clinical depression, anxiety disorders, and the likes happen. Uh, a good friend of mine has this phrase, we are the maintenance crew of the fairground, right? When nothing goes wrong, nobody cares about us. A few mangle children comes up, and suddenly the most famous person in the town, right? Um, what can you do with this? Well, good training, make people feel like they're, they're mastery, that if there's a page, it's not a big deal. Get in good incident management training. Do drills so people don't freak out when they get paged. Uh, even under a massive incident, they should just know, I need to do this, we have a checklist for this, I need to talk to this, I am the incident managing controller, I'm not going to get stuck into debugging, I'm just going to find someone to do the debugging, someone to do the communications, etc., etc. Uh, not sure this is a big thing for network engineers, but well, let's talk about it anyway. Uh, we have never had more, sorry, we never have, we've never had more frameworks, languages, designs, uh, infrastructure than we have right now, and we will never have less than we have right now. Uh, some monoliths of code uh, and are, are, are turn out to be really great for developers. It's like, oh yeah, I just write anything in, I've got all the libraries that I need, this is wonderful. I have one binary that I need to compile, that's also wonderful. It's a nightmare for operations. Operations teams much prefer things like microservices or distributed systems. Um, something more likely up your alley is uh, mature systems. These are systems where everyone thinks they work fine, there's never really any problems, so don't worry about it, you don't need headcamp to support it, it it'll, it'll be fine. And it turns out these can accumulate over time until the next thing you know you're on call for 15 things that breaks once in a blue moon, but your whole team needs to know about all of it just in case. And they are really hard to get rid of. Uh, there's a fire hose of data that just keeps coming in, new changes, new patches, new bugs, new security updates. Uh, you need to compartmentalize that. Try not to learn too much or your brain will melt. Uh, and lastly, abstractions are actually quicksand. An awful lot of people, for instance, they think, oh yeah, we've just got a mesh network, it's really simple, it just looks like one flat Ethernet segment. Yeah, uh, that's great for designing higher layer protocols on, for the operations team who's trying to debug a mesh Ethernet thing, uh, it's a nightmare. So lastly, I also detest imaginary <laughs> expectations. So. On any system where you don't have an SLA, your users will invent one. And they'll invent one that suits them. I only had to deal with a problem this week where uh, we had a database and one of our services was going to hit this database 10 times each time a user pinged in. So when the database latency is 20 milliseconds, great. They get an answer in 200 milliseconds, everyone's happy. Nobody told them that sometimes the database gets loaded and then it goes up to 200 milliseconds instead of 20 and everything go, goes to pieces. Now, had you, they asked the team originally, will you always be 20 milliseconds? They went, we're at 20 milliseconds, that's amazing. Oh yeah, it must be that new hardware type we have. It'll change once we get a new, uh, new software launch and we have actual load on this database. So if you don't have those kind of SLAs published, you will, they, your users will make them up and you will be involved. Uh, an SLA should also direct your team's effort. Like you should be able to look at the dashboard and go, ooh, that's the one we're most missing. Let's go in that direction. Uh, anyone on your team, if they get approached by somebody outside the team, say, hey, can your team support X? They should know based on like, your team mission and your SLAs, now that, that fits with us or that doesn't fit with us. Or they should be able to say, uh, we want to do this to your system, is that cool? And they should know the SLAs well enough, they go, mm, 
if you're going to put that much load on, we won't be able to meet it. Give us two months, we can do that work. So if you can find me the budget or whatever for those two months, that's what you need to do. Uh, there's another one here I have in here. Are we being watched? Do you ever, anyone got a team where directors and VPs think your work is so important that they want to drop by and have chats? Uh, that's a team that is not safe. If they can't be trusted by upper management, it feels horrible. Uh, and a good example of this is, does your team know whether or not they can close bugs as couldn't be bothered? Right? Because people can often, bugs are like, you know, the, the monkey on your back where you go, oh, I've got a monkey, I'll just throw it at that person, now they now have to deal with it. Um, you open a bug against somebody and it's like, sweet, now they have to do it because I love the bug. No, does that team, is that team able to turn around and go, that look, work looks boring, I don't want to do it? Because you should be able to. If someone says, hey, uh, we bought this system, it's automation, uh, API is, is, not, is shit, so you're going to have loads, and loads of operations work, your operations team should be able to look at that and go, that looks like there's going to be a lot of boring work, we don't want to do that, sorry. Uh, and if you can't do that, that team is going to be under pressure because you're always going to feel like you can't do your score. So, we need to do this. If anything I've said here seems interesting, uh, give this a go. Give your team a short survey. Maybe build it into your company's uh, uh, I don't know, employee attitude survey or something like that. Based on the five questions I had there, or look up Project Aristotle as a bunch of uh, ideas on, on questions you could use to assess safety. Discuss with the team what they think safety means. What you know, some people might say, we're in a data center and I'm pretty sure I'm going to go deaf at an early age. That's not psychological, but go talk to the team. Uh, and lastly, build a culture of clear and, say, and, and respectful communication, um, starting with you. And if possible, encourage your leadership to go along because everyone else will copy you. Thank you. <laughs>